I'm Dustin Ghost to Hollywood. I'm Mally Moore. And you are listening to the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's most bleak endings. Mm. Happy <clears throat> Valentine's? Sure. No. Whatever. I don't like it. Nope. That. Nope. Not even. Nope. We're nope. a week off. Yep. <laughs> uh. um, Black History Month? Yeah, let's go with that. Okay. And a film that features approximately 0% uh, African Americans. Yeah, but only <clears> one <throat> white dude. Two. Shit. Never mind. And a white woman. God damn it. And uh, actually, actually know way more white people than that. <laughs> Are we racist? No. Uh, I don't know where to go for that. You leave me much leeway there. This week, it is Only God Forgives. Yes. This week's episode uh, is 2013's Only God Forgives. The follow-up to Nicholas Winding Reference cult classic, Drive. If you liked how Ryan Gosling didn't talk much in Drive, get ready for him to talk even less. Only 17 lines, apparently, in this movie. That's more than I thought. I thought it was like six. It's very it's very low. I'm pretty sure all of his dialogue is in the trailer. Yeah, probably. Um, for those who are new to the show, thank you for tuning in, first of all. Second of all... Uh, this is going to be an interesting episode. We say that every time. And they're all interesting, they're, I think. We yeah. pick movies that we like or in, like, movies that are just crazy stupid like Planet of the Apes. So this one, <laughs> it's, it's, it's cool to talk about a movie we actually both like and want to talk about. So, yes. Uh, what we like to do is take movies such as Only God Forgives, which if you've not seen it, please turn off this episode go watch it and come back because we're going to spoil the show it is as fuck absolutely and we're going to talk about that too but if this is your first time listening to our show we like to take movies such as only god forgives that have downer endings sad endings fucked up endings whatever you want to call them endings that don't like make let you feel too great after you watch it and for the character seat we try to find the good in those things uh something that you can walk away with well at least this happened to give you a little bit of a pick me up, and then we also offer alternative movies that you can watch after you watch uh, this episode, uh, this week's movie, to kind of live, uh, bring your, your spirits back up. Yeah, and we don't do too good of a job, but nope. it's still, you know, we still talk about movies we enjoy for the most part. For sure. Uh, this week's episode, as we've talked about already, only God forgives. Mally, do you want to talk about your relationship with this movie? I mean, I love Nicholas Winding Refn. One of my favorite, as do I. One of my one of my favorite direct, di- <clears throat> one of my favorite directors, and you know I love me some Baby Goose. And he needs uh, Refn is a very visual director. Oh yeah, um, like again, Drive and this Ryan Gosling barely talking, super long takes of just people staring at one another. But there has some hints as fuck, and it has a lot of underlying substance. I think that oh yeah, most like, people miss out on. I was actually just talking to someone the other day about like subtext mm-hmm. in film, and th- that's that's how that's all Nicholas Winding Refn is. So is did subtext. you did you see this movie in the theater? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, I didn't get a chance to because I don't think it came to my town. If yeah, I'm not no, mistaken, I had to travel. A, well, actually, no, wait, no, I didn't. This no, sorry. I'm thinking of a different movie. Mm-hmm. I'm an idiot. Mm-hmm. Um, no, this I, this is when I lived in Chicago, and Chicago gets fucking everything. So I was able to see <laughs> this. Um, same with Drive, actually. I um, see. I missed the the wave of Drive. I didn't even know about it until like three or four years later. And when I finally saw that, I was like, "Holy shit!" And then yeah. that's when I found out Only God Forgives was coming out, and was like, "I'm in." Um, and, like, I would recommend this movie to people all the time. Mm-hmm. And they would like come in the next day. Like I would always recommend it to like people I worked with. They'd come in the next day and be like, dude, what the fuck did I just watch? Like that was boring as shit. I'm like, yeah, but it was fucking rad, wasn't it? They're like, no. I'm like, you're an idiot. It's hard to find. Well, I want to say it's hard to find people that like this movie because there are people that like it, but it's, it's hard to find people that uh, can really like when you recommend this movie, you have to really know who you're recommending yeah. it to. And see, I said, fuck it. I'm like, I'm recommending this to everybody. It's definitely not a movie for everyone. And I can understand why some people don't like it. But I think there's so much to talk about that a lot of people might miss on their first pass. And we're going to get into that today. Uh, my relationship with this movie, I didn't get to see it in theaters, unfortunately. I ended up uh, watching it sometime after it came out on DVD. Yeah, and it, was was, on, it was on. It was. It had a long... Netflix uh, run, Netflix run, and it, it was, was great. For a while. I remember the first time seeing it. I watched it with with a, my roommate at the time, and we were both just like impressed 
because visually this movie is like oh it's like a fucking four course meal like served on a silver platter this movie's got so much to look at it's beautiful i think, think this it really is it's such a good looking movie but let's talk about the movie itself it's director like we mentioned nicholas winding reffin starring ryan gosling Kristen scott thomas gordon brown tom burke i'm probably gonna butcher this name and i apologize but chang played uh who's the character uh vithea Penzringram, Pen, Ringram, i think is how you pronounce it byron gibson and i can't pronounce his other name i'm not even gonna try but basically chang's right hand man yeah Budget of only four point eight million, worldwide gross of ten million. Sleeper movie. Uh, didn't really get that much attention at the box office, and I think it's a little unfortunate. But it sits at a forty-one percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Ah, oh, bullshit. One of the few times uh, that I think we disagree a hundred percent with. Oh yeah, no. That sure. Rotten Tomatoes meter. Um, speaking of how it's a visual movie, the DP of this. Yeah. Larry Smith. He has not done a lot. And the stuff he has done is like, you know, just com- kind of confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's done kind of some like, like it's all like very low budget stuff and like some kind of weird, like very like mainstream things. But he did also do Bronson. Bronson's a fun visual Bronson, movie too. Another great visual movie. But yeah. Guy's name is Larry Smith. Like he did. What is it? A uh, year or two before this came out, he did The Guard that uh, Brendan Gleeson, um, Don Cheadle movie. I don't think I saw that one. Oh. But well, yeah, this movie is... Uh, visually, it looks nothing like this. No, and it's a great looking movie. And he was... Okay, he's credited... Okay, IMDb is weird. So he's credited as cinematographer for Eyes Wide Shut. But in parentheses, it says lighting cameraman. I don't, I don't know what that means. Hmm. Not sure. Uh, do you want to listen to the trailer so we can give people a little bit of a taste of what we're going to get into? Oh, absolutely. Well, let's do it. So what do you think of this trailer? Um, It kind of does the same thing the Drive trailer does. It makes it seem a lot more action-packed than it actually is yeah 100 it's a little misleading but i think the trailer itself is just so fun it's oh, that trailer is fantastic it tastes good on the palate mm-hmm. just watching it you're like yes i want that that looks great give me that uh and i guess a lot of people were dissatisfied in the end result however i think this movie's got a lot hidden under the surface that we're going to talk about when we oh, get yeah. into it um do you want to start talking about the film or do you have anything else you want to talk about no, uh, in all right, so let's go ahead and set up the pr- the basic premise. Yeah. Ryan Gosling, Julian. Mm-hmm. He's a drug dealer. A uh, drug smuggler. A drug smuggler or whatever in Thailand, hiding out in Thailand. Mm-hmm. He owns and like he runs the operation from a Thai boxing gym. Gym, pretty like much. Like a Muay Thai boxing gym, yeah. co-owns with his, or co-runs with his brother, mm-hmm. Billy. Billy, yes. Played by uh, Tom Burke. Sure. Um, and so the, the whole thing that sets the movie's plot, uh, in motion, in motion is Billy decides that he's going to go get a prostitute and well, I, I wouldn't say he just decides Billy's well, okay. got something clearly. I think both, <clears throat> both brothers have something clearly oh, wrong he, with them. Absolutely. Um, but Billy mentions verbatim he, that he wants to fuck a 14 year old girl. Yep. And the brothel owner doesn't, won't, so he be, not only beats the, like, bashes the brothel owner over the bottle. head with a bottle, beats he the women, beats the prostitutes. Which, I there is a little bit of comedy in here, because the brothel bit. owner mentions that, because he, uh, Billy asked him, uh, are these all women? And he said, yeah, 50%. Yeah. <laughs> I got a little laugh out of that, but yeah, it's very, this is like the the clockwork orange for Nicholas Winding Refn, I think there's a lot of ultra violence in here. Um, but yeah, that's what sets the motion, pl- the plot in motion is that Billy, uh, attacks this brothel owner and he's clearly some, something is wrong with him mentally. Cause he tries to pick up another prostitute later, uh, rapes and beats this girl who I think is 16. Mm-hmm. Uh, and do you want to pick it up from there? What happens? Uh, so pretty much he ends up killing this girl brutally, brutally killing her. Um, 
And then we're introduced to Chang, who is like, he's a retired cop. Mm -hmm. Like his outfit is what retired cops in Thailand wear. But yeah. like, you see, he's still running shit pretty mm -hmm. much. And like he, like at the moment he walks on screen, you're like, this dude is not to be fucked with. Yeah, he's he's got a very authoritative presence mm -hmm. to him, hundred percent. So Chang walks in, he sees the dead girl, he sees Billy sitting in the corner, and they bring in the girl's dad. And Chang's pretty much like, "How could you let this happen? How could you let this happen?" Um, and he leaves her with Billy. He's like, "Do what you need to do." Mm -hmm. The guy beats Billy to death with a bat. And then Chang takes the guy, takes the dad out and is like, and the dad's like pleading for his life. He's like, I don't understand. Like, you told me to. Like, you told me to. Like, he killed my daughter. Like, and Chang was like, well, you should have been in control. You knew yeah. she was out there selling her body. Which this pretty much sets up Chang's whole thing. Like, Chang is just like, justice has to be served. Mm -hmm. Like, he raped your daughter. You killed him. Justice is served, mm -hmm. but you're the one that was whoring at your daughter in the first place. And you killed a man. And you killed a man, so justice needs to be served. And he fucking cuts his arm off. Yep, cuts, cuts that and arm so right off. That's pretty much the plot right there is that Julian's and Billy's mom arrives, played by what, Kristen, uh, Kristen Scott, Scott Thomas. Thomas. Fucking killing it. Dude, she plays the... I, I, again, there's something clearly wrong with this family, but Clay's the the bitchy American mom, like mm -hmm. the uptight Beverly Hills mom, to a T. <clears throat> and yeah, the plot is basically Billy's mom. Uh, I think her name is Chris. Crystal yeah. wants revenge for Billy's death, and so, so she tries to get Julian to find out who did it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the plot is all these people trying to take out these, Chang. Well, and Chang trying to find out who's trying to take him out. Yeah, and it all just like. Oh, it's fucking insane. So Crystal... And it's all done with almost no dialogue. Yeah, Crystal gets her son Julian and his kind of crew that he has there and says, look, you need to find out who killed Billy. Bring him, bring me uh, this dude, kill him, whatever. And then uh, they find out, well, Chang was involved too in Billy's death, so they want revenge on that. They would try to put out hits on Chang, but Chang just is one step ahead of him the whole time. Mm -hmm. And basically Chang just is getting his revenge on all these people trying to kill him the whole time. So it's basically getting revenge for getting revenge, pretty much. And it's like you said, it's it's all done with very little dialogue, yeah. and the dialogue that is spoken is like it, it does one of the two things pretty much. It either moves the story forward or gives your character a uh, backstory. Yeah. So there's no wasted dialogue in this movie, I don't think. No, and it's God, it's just so fucking great. So um, and yeah, I don't. I don't know. Sorry, go ahead. I have a theory I want to get into, but first let's talk about the things we do like and then the things we don't like about this movie. One thing I do like, which mm -hmm. you were just saying is how the dialogue that is there is, you know, relevant. Yeah, it's not, but there's no fat. Let's go in. This ties into my cute clue from last week. Mm -hmm. One of, at one point, Julian, like you find out Julian pretty much goes to the same prostitute all the time. Yeah, uh, Mai. Mai. Who is um, a and there's beautiful a woman. Gorgeous. God. Um, there's a weird little scene. Like, it's one of your first scenes with Julian after Billy's killed. Is this the uh, strip tease scene? Yeah, where yeah. she like... So, he's sitting in a chair in the corner of a room. Mm -hmm. Mai walks in, ties his arms to the chair, sits in front of him on the bed, and just masturbates. Mm -hmm. Which, That's the, and he just stares at her dead ass look on his face yeah it's uh, but which is pretty much julian's i don't think he ever has any kind of expression mm -mm. even during the fight between him and chang later on there's zero expression in his face this whole, and i think the only time he has any kind of emotion is when he yells at my which mm -hmm. is literally three words <laughs> yeah. um but so later there's a scene where he brings my to dinner with his mother crystal and this is the dialogue that happens in that scene crystal so tell me, Mai, what line of work are you in? Mai, I'm an entertainer. Crystal, an entertainer? And how many cocks can you entertain with that cute little cum dumpster of yours? Mm-hmm. You know how... How that insult Yeah, happened? I was going to say how they arrived yeah, at the Nicholas choice of words. Nicholas Winding Refn asked Ryan Gosling to write down like the top ten worst things to call a woman, and cum dumpster was number one. <laughs> That's, and I agree. That yeah, is fucking awful. That is awful. Don't get me wrong. I called someone a cum dumpster, cum dumpster like two days ago, mm -hmm. and it was horrible. It was funny. It's, but still, that's it's, it's a one, funny that's insult, but it is. Worst things you can call a woman. 
Um, but yeah, so I like the dialogue too because again, there is no fat on this movie in terms of dialogue. It's all plot driven. It all gives you character backstory, and it also, uh, like most Nicholas Winding Refn movies, it also has this cool factor to it. Oh yeah, where everyone in this movie. Uh, other than I would say Crystal are pretty expressionless. Yeah, like there's not. It's mostly deadpan uh, deliveries, and I think that's intentional because of, like I said, I'll get into my theory later about it. But um, that goes in line with the with the visuals of the movie because this movie is all lit with practical lighting except for a few scenes here and there. Yeah. Um, and like we were watching just before we started recording the the behind the scenes of how you know they filmed everything, and it's all seems. At least from what we gathered, that it's all pretty much on the spot. Like yeah, like they were like making like we were watching the behind the scenes of them setting up for the big shootout scene. Yeah, where, with uh, Chang in the restaurant, and they were literally just like, "All right, so I'm thinking we should probably do a wide shot here, and mm-hmm. then let's go and tighter for another wide shot." Yeah, let's like, do two just masters. Making up the yeah. shot list, like mm-hmm. right there. Like, yeah, like not only that, this at least that scene. Would have been like pre-vised a lot. Mm-hmm. No, it feels like they arrived on look. They did a location scout, arrived on there, and like, all right, what can we do with the space? And the reason for that Dude, is, we- I don't even like. Honestly, from watching that, I don't even like. I feel like they didn't even scout location. They were they just literally like loaded the camera truck and just drove, drove around. around. Like that looks cool. You want to do that scene there? Yes. Well, it's also what we, we come to find out was they production in Thailand is very difficult when it, and when it comes to night and shoots in the public because the using prop weapons and everything is a lot of hassle with a lot of permits and it can cost a lot of money. Um, and not only that, the people of Thailand apparently don't want their country to be displayed in this kind of certain light in terms of how you do certain things. So it's a very very tricky slope to go around and. Uh, if you watch the film uh, "My Life," directed by Nicholas Winding Refn, mm-hmm. which I might it might still be on Netflix. No, it is. I, I, I it was it was on there two hours ago. Okay, uh, it, it's it's kind of a documentary about the making of this movie with uh, it's directed by uh, Nicholas Winding Refn's wife. Yeah, and basically they the they were having like a Thailand film festival and they invited Ryan Gosling and, and uh Refn to the sh- to the festival and said we will pay you to show up and do like a kind of a Q&A about drive and about the making of only god forgives and they did that got paid and used that money to bribe the local authorities to shoot on location and yep. all these different spots which is crazy I mean, that means that they were already in production for this movie and didn't have the permits to shoot anywhere and just kind of like made it up as they go along, which is insane. Yep. Um, and watching these behind the scene features, you get to see that Refn is very much like he's, he's clearly a visual director yeah. because he knows he's like, I want a 32 for this, so it looks like you're shooting right down the barrel, yep. which we, we definitely see when we mm-hmm. see the, the shootout at the restaurant. But he knows exactly what he wants, and he's even telling his actors, I want you to be here. This is what you're feeling right here. And he does it all, which is, I think. A hundred percent, what a director has to do. It can't mm-hmm. be visual. It can't be all visual. It can't be all talent. It has to be the whole the whole spectrum. And whether you agree that this movie is quote unquote boring or lacks substance or whatever, you can admit that this movie is visually incredible looking. Oh, the the natural it's lighting choices, the shot gorgeous. usage, just the amount of like dolly shots in dolly shuts out following people it's all very smooth it's all very methodical and it goes in line with the performances that the actors deliver because they all are methodical they're all delivering nothing except exactly what needs to happen in that moment yeah and I, that's one reason that it draws me to this movie because it's similar to drive drive is the same way but drive also has this like uh very apparent kind of spiritualness to it it's very like uh, otherworldly almost mm-hmm. especially in like scenes like the elevator scene and drive and stuff like that whereas this movie it's all almost to a creepy level subliminal throughout all the images and everything that you see in it and all the dialogue that you hear and all the the scenes and the characters and everything else it all feels like something's just a little off and i, I think it plays up to to his specialties as a director and as a writer it fucking works great for me so, what else did you like about this movie? Just fucking everything. Should we talk about the soundtrack? Uh, yeah. Um, fuck Stranger Things, you know? <laughs> Stranger Things definitely... They uh, ripped 
they ripped the main theme for Stranger Things was ripped straight from Cliff Martinez's score. <laughs> Which, dude, I gotta say, Cliff Martinez knows how to fucking score a movie, dude. Him and dude, his, oh my, him God. and his music supervisor. Which I don't, I'm not sure that person's name is, but holy shit, the score, the, the soundtrack for Drive and the soundtrack for this, incredible. Cliff Martinez is the fucking shit. That's just all there is to it. Uh, jeez, and yeah, the 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 song is literally called "Wanna Fight" that you're talking about. The the fight scene between Chang and yeah. and Julian, hundred percent. Uh, I think the group is named uh, Survive or Survival or something like that. That does uh, the Stranger Things like soundtrack. That. Definitely, they they were inspired for their theme songs. Oh yeah. So yeah, the score in this movie just plays up with that whole. It's kind of like the CD parts. Like if you took all the spectacle out of Las Vegas, I feel like that's what this movie is. Like the neon lights, yeah, and the like seedier parts of it, and, like of Thailand. You, but it's also the city still looks incredible. Like even in the daytime, the scenes like whether uh, I think it's uh, Julian Julian's mom is like on the balcony in her penthouse suite, and you get to see the whole city while it's covered in a little bit of smog. It mm-hmm. still looks crazy good. Like yeah. And it's all, <clears throat> for the most part, natural lighting. And I don't know. I, I There's so much I could gush about this movie, but is, is there anything else? I, I don't mean to steal your thunder. Um, uh, one thing I do find interesting is how Nicholas Winding Refn apparently directed the guy that plays Chang. Mm-hmm. Like, literally the only direction he would give him, he would walk up to him, whisper in his ear, you are God. Mm-hmm. That's fucking insane. That also has to go in line with my my theory. That's fucking insane. Um, also, speaking of like supernatural stuff, so you've seen Valhalla Rising. I've seen p- parts of it. I haven't seen the whole thing. Okay, well, Valhalla Rising was Nicholas Winding Refn's first film. Um, similar to this, like uh, the main, the lead actor, like it's kind of it's like takes place in like Viking times. The lead actor played by. Or the lead character played by Mads Mikkelsen, which that was the first movie I ever saw him in. I was like, this guy's fucking awesome. And now he's in like everything good. I think I saw him first as Le Chief in Casino oh, Royale. Shit? Yeah. And um, I loved him. But then, like him, he's the lead character. No dialogue. No. I heard that. I heard that. There's nothing um, in there. But he's kind of a badass. And Nicholas Winding Refn has been um, hinting at like, you're going to see one eye again in some form. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people think that Chang is yeah. the reincarnation. I did hear that. And yeah. then Nicholas Winding Refn actually has a new movie coming out. Yeah. Uh, um, what's it called? Fuck. I know this one. I don't know. Let me look up what that is. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Look it up, Mally. I'm look trying. it up. Go fuck look. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't find it. But anyway, um, he's working on a new movie that I believe is going to star Mads Mikkelsen, and it's supposedly the reincarnation of One Eye. <laughs> um, so yeah, he just doesn't let that go. Is it Dying of the Light? No, that's a Nicolas Cage movie. I don't know. But anyway, makes for great podcasting. Looking up on IMDb, yeah. But yeah, no, like Nicholas Winding Refn is just the fucking man. Like, and it's weird, like how he directs. Like we were watching, like that behind the scenes thing, and like the first thing I think you said was, it looks like he's a student. Like he's directing <laughs> it like a student film. Which, also, fun fact: he turned down the role. He turned down the opportunity to uh, direct Spectre. Oh, that, that would have been interesting. Can you imagine James Bond not talking? Directed <laughs> by Nicholas Winding Refn. Hmm. Did you uh, get to see the Neon Demon? Because I haven't got a chance to see it. I have not, and I'm sad about it. Well, anyways, um, yeah, the the student filmmaker thing. I mean that in both a compliment and not a compliment, which might sound weird on this on the surface, but let me explain. Uh. A student, I, at least from my experience, of having been one formerly, a student filmmaker is more concerned about the action mm-hmm. in a shot than the the reasoning behind it. And I noticed while we were watching this behind the scenes that he's basically saying, "All right, this character is going to be here. He's going to do this. He's going to. We, we. I want the camera to do this the whole time. He's seeing it in his head, the full version of 
the final product, yeah. which is like you've seen the whole thing. It's a good and bad quality, I think, in a director because they're more they get locked into this 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 final version, which. Refn is definitely an auteur director, and it obviously mm-hmm. it pays off because his work speaks for itself, and that's that's kind of the thing. Because I was like, you know, I was I was similar at directing my short films. I was like, I had the final product in mind, but for a movie like no, this, I'm the same way. We were just talking about this. For a movie like this, I think you definitely need to know like the subtext behind all of it to really mm-hmm. appreciate exactly what's going on, and. Uh, I, do we want to talk up before we get, I, w- I really have this theory i want to get out and hear what you think about but i no. really want to talk about is there anything else we missed like we talked about the score the cinematography um, the direction oh, let's talk about all right let's get into some of the actual scenes of the movie yeah perfect let's talk okay so towards the kind of climax um is julian's off looking for chang he's at chang's house mm-hmm. with one of his goons the goon goes to kill Chang's kid, and Julian kills him because he's like, okay. At the request of Crystal. Him. Crystal says, yes. kill Chang, kill his wife, kill his daughter. Meanwhile, Chang finds Crystal and kills her, like stabs her in the fucking throat. Yeah. And Julian comes back and finds her body. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about what Julian does when he finds the body. This, again, this is going to go with live with my theory, but t- you want to tell us what exactly so what happens? So Julian walks up to his dead mother's body. Completely stoic, no emotion. Mm-hmm. Cuts open her stomach mm-hmm. and reaches inside and mm-hmm. is like feeling around. Well, he's he's and feeling like, around for something specific. Uterus. Yeah, he's he's reaching literally into her stomach to and her like, uterus. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk? You, uh, what do you think? Is I know you you more than likely read the trivia no, about know, why I he know did why it. Why they made that choice? Within the context of, the, I mean, I, I, it just goes into the whole relationship with Julian and Billy and her mom mm-hmm. or their mom. And so, why do you think he does that, it? And it's revealed that Julian killed the reason they're in Thailand is because Julian killed his father with his bare fucking hands. For what we don't really yeah. get into, but it's in, I th- they feel like they kind of imply it that it's in defense of the, his mother, kind of. But again, the whole relationship between Julian. And his mother, like, there's during the dinner scene with Mai, Crystal goes on this rant about how Julian was always jealous of Billy because Billy was closer with and, Crystal, and Billy had a bigger dick. Not that Julian's was small. Not that Julian's was small, but Billy's was enormous. But Billy's was huge. <laughs> and this is their mother saying. I that. love the way the scene plays out because Ryan Gosling, like, the whole time he's talking, he's just. Hands on the table, folded, watching her, expressionless, mm-hmm. like, Mom. But you can see it in his face. Internally, he's probably screaming. And he's just taking it on the chin, like, yep. <laughs> oh, Plus, God. this scene is also shot beautifully, because that backdrop behind Crystal amazing. is like, amazing, dude. Um, what do you make of Julian and Mai's relationship? I feel like it's, <laughs> it's this might be, like, heresy to say, but I feel like it's kind of filler. Because I feel like nothing truly comes yeah. of it. Like, we don't well, even get to see... There was a little bit... We'll talk about this at the end after we discuss how the movie ends. Mm-hmm. Which we can move on to after this. Yeah. Let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and talk about that. So, the way this movie ends... Mm-hmm. The reason we chose to do it. The reason we chose to do it. So, before Chang kills Crystal, the night before that, Julian, Julian and Chang finally have their battle. A fist fight. Like, literally, Julian walks up to Chang. He's like, I want to fight. Mm-hmm. And then there's just this fucking great, like, beautifully shot with that fucking Cliff Martinez score. Fucking God, bumping. dude, that song is so fucking and good. Julian doesn't land a fucking a, punch. He doesn't touch. Doesn't Chang touch him. whoops his ass. We should also mention, too, uh, that... Chang and Julian, this whole movie, kind of have a will-they-won't-they they kind of relationship because mm-hmm. Chang knows that Julian is somehow involved with all the people that are trying to get a hit on him, hit out on him while Julian knows that Chang had something to do with Billy's murder. And that's kind of their, their play the whole time. Um, but yeah, they have a fight that is just so fucking... The, chore- the choreography and the fucking visual... Sh- the, the shot choices are insane. Like, it's so methodical. It's so well rehearsed and acted. But yeah, so they have their fight. And then, so Julian and his goon are sent to kill Chang's family. 
the goon kills Chang's wife, goes to kill the kid, and Julian stops him and mm-hmm. kills him instead, and the kid lives. Chang kills Crystal. Julian comes back, finds Crystal. And then he kind of turns himself into Chang. Yeah, and then... Yeah, like he pretty much turns himself Well, actually, in. he doesn't really turn himself in. He's at the... the uh, it's not really a strip club, but he goes to the club where basically my dance is, and Chang yeah. finds him there. And he kind of turns himself and in. And then it then. cuts to them in a field. In the forest, yeah. With um, Julian staring at his arms. Because there's a few POV shots of just Julian's like hands. His hands, him clenching his hands in anger. And and then a little quick. You don't, they don't really technically show it, but it's implied that Chang cuts off both of Julian's arms. Yeah. And then cut to Chang singing karaoke, and that's it. There's a lot of karaoke in this movie, which I got to ask, do you know about the karaoke? Like why it's so dominant in this movie? Avid karaoke enthusiast. Just because it's cool. I did some research on this when I first saw this movie because I was curious as to what the karaoke was supposed to mean. But apparently in Thailand and in the culture of of their specific country, uh, karaoke is a very serious thing over there. It's a very spiritual thing. It's almost like getting in front of your congregation at church and singing, singing a hymn. Like the song choice, they take it very seriously. Like here, it's kind of like you go to a bar, you sing karaoke, it's fun. For them, mm-hmm. it's a very spiritual thing. Dude, sing and for it's your fucking stuff. I take that shit seriously. And not only that, but the, you can see in the in this movie I'll that a tiny dancer on the rig. <laughs> you can see in this movie that the audience that watches Chang perform, even though it's his his other police former police officers, mm-hmm. it's it's all taken very seriously. And there's like there's three karaoke scenes. Yeah, all with Chang singing. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, that's the ending of the movie. Do you want to talk about what you think it means? Well, let me talk going back to your thing about my Oh yeah, sorry. In the script. Um this actually might have I don't know if they ever sh- I don't know if they shot it or not. I don't think they did. There's a scene after that mm-hmm. that is just Julian in the brothel armless. Yeah, I did read getting this. Getting fed pudding by my. Yeah, I did read that. I feel like that would have. I don't like that. Yeah, I don't like it either. That would have been. That would have like that. I I can't imagine that not in a comedic way. Yeah, it almost makes me think of the ending of Requiem for a Dream when uh, Jerry Leto doesn't have an arm, and mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like shocking, but at the same time, it's kind of like it. It's hard to show an amputee, um, a lead character amputee, like that gets their arm removed throughout the story. Especially if they're feeding him, if he, she's getting, he, she's being fed pudding, to not kind of have a little chuckle at it, I think. Um, so I, I, I've been mentioning it this whole time, but I have a theory about what this movie means. Okay. And before I, I, I want to hear what you think. The, I mean, obviously it's kind of this gangster-ish thriller, yeah. uh, but there's clearly a lot more at stake here. That's kind of the surface level stuff. What do you think it actually means? Um. Fuck, dude. Um, I mean, it's like I don't know. Well, obviously, I, I, there's I something. No, to be obviously honest. with the karaoke, with the whole visual like, aspect of like, it. I believe the whole thing of like Chang being pretty much God. That goes in line with my theory. Yeah. So I did a little research about this, and this seems to be kind of a universal opinion amongst the people that actually enjoy this movie. That the idea is that, uh. Julian is essentially just a man, Mm -hmm. which we can all agree 100% that he is. But Chang is the physical embodiment of a god, right? Which would explain, which would explain reference direction, Mm -hmm. and that his mom Crystal is a representation of the devil. Mm -hmm. And Julian, Mm -hmm. this is kind of like the trials of Job in the in the book of the Bible, where the devil tempts him. And then Job, you I know. I, okay, I, I've always thought of Chang as a god, but I never really... See, I didn't until this watch. The mother could be like the devil. I didn't until this watch, which when you t- say a movie that a character represents God and a character represents the devil, it always feels a little cliche, a little mm-hmm. cheesy, a little passe. But this one, it seems like it's the 100% the actual physical embodiment of these characters. The reason I say that is because, one, Chang is never injured. And he enacts just he's it's kind of like a vengeful god. It's not like a passionate one. Right. And the reason we say I say that is because he lets uh 
the prostitute's dad get his revenge on Billy, which, you know, you can argue, debate on about whether that's a moral thing, 100%, but he gets his revenge definitely on the man that kills Billy, because that's murder, cuts his arms off, and the, his sword is his judgment. Mm-hmm. So he uh, kills the man that tries to shoot him with a gun in the alley. We don't get to see what happens to the other guy, but it's presumed that he gets uh, his punishment as well. And he cuts Julian's arms off at the end of the movie. Plus, he gets his revenge on Crystal for putting the hit out on him. Yep. So he kind of gets rid of the devil. And it also goes in line with Julian's character as well. Because the whole time Julian is tempted by his mother. His mother comes into Thailand. She tells him, you know, you need to find out who oh, killed Billy. I'm just clicked in my head. Continue. You need to find out who killed Billy. Do this one thing for me. Mm-hmm. She, even, she says that, you know, I, I swore I would never ask you to do anything else after your father. But... Do this one thing for me. Get revenge on who killed Billy. So, Billy could be one of his, you know, fallen angels, his other fallen right, angels, right. and that could also explain why Julian is such is a little off mentally and why he's so ultra violent, as well as Billy was. And it would also explain explain the drug smuggling, pretty much everything that Julian's involved with is is not great morally. Um, and Julian realizes this after he opens up his mother's stomach and examines her uterus very pretty much i think it kind of implies that she's a uh, barren not that she can't she never could have kids because obviously she does but that she's now barren mm-hmm. like she's given birth to the evil quote unquote on earth right and god has enacted his revenge on the devil julian gets to see it for his own and that's why he kind of turns himself in he lets god judge him which is why he holds his arms out and accepts the fate that God bestows okay. on him. Which would also, you know, that brings in, the, again, the karaoke. Uh, it explains the spirituality of the whole thing. And a scene we haven't even talked about, but the judgment he gets on Gordon, who is this Irishman that oh, the devil, quote-unquote, uh, Crystal, hires to take out Chang. About, how did I forget about that scene? Uh, the, the torture scene, pretty much. Uh, he gets his revenge on that one. That's another example right there. And we should mention Chang's uh, judgment is brutal. Oh, he does not fuck around. So before we get into that, can we, should we talk about the torture scene? Or do you want to give your rebuttal? Because well, I know you said on. you had something Real clicked. Quick. Well, that just gives such more meaning to the line right before Billy leaves to go find a 14-year-old prostitute. He looks at Julie and he's like, time, time to, to meet, meet the, devil. the devil. Yep. Because that line always bothered me because I never understood what he was talking that about. Which leads into you being introduced to Chang, mm-hmm. but I think that line was intended... To throw you off. To throw you off. Like, that was a red herring of a line. Yeah. Well, there was something else I wanted to mention that it just clicked for me, too, that I wanted to bring up. But is there anything else you wanted to talk no, about? No, that was it. <laughs> Shit, there was something else that I had just thought about, which I, I still understand what Mai's relationship has to do with the whole story. Uh, that's the only part that doesn't click for me. Um... But that's kind of like the the universal agreement on She's what this an movie. Angel. Is. She's an angel that's sent to rescue him, which could be because she makes that mention. Why do you let her talk to you like that after their dinner? She's his guardian angel. Could be. It very well could be, considering God, that conversation they have. The fucking puzzle. Just and we don't really see Mai after that, except at the very end when he shows back up and Chang arrives. Um. Sh- oh yeah, what I was gonna mention, Chang has a very godlike kind of. Not only presence, mm-hmm. but if you remember in that torture scene, uh, when he cuts when he uh, cuts uh, Gordon's eyes out yeah. or gouges him, he mentions, "You can't see what's good for you, therefore you shouldn't see." Yep. That's a very godlike oh, kind yeah. of mentality. You uh, you don't listen well, so there's no sense in you hearing before he shoves the uh, the picks into his ears. Which again, if you haven't seen this movie, brutal. yeah, let's see. What's on with Gordon, he stabs stabs through his wrist through both of his hands through his wrist too not just his hands i'm pretty sure it's his wrist dude which is way worse than your hands and then through his Um, knees well not his knees but his his like inner thigh not inner thighs but like right above his knees above his knees gouges his eyes out and shows picks through his ears ears. so now he's blind to death that is raw fucking rough dude Rough, rough rough um yeah, man. And that there's also a scene where uh, Chang finds the two uh, Thai men that tried to take him out. Uh, one that's kind of blabbering away. Like, see, it was all that guy's idea. The guy in the scarf. 
that we see in the in the shootout, and the other guy who's a lot more calm that's feeding his son when we find him. Mm-hmm. But whenever that whenever Chang is in that dude's presence, in that in that guy's presence, his kid has a very like awe inspired look mm-hmm. on his face, which I always didn't understand that either. Why is this kid so predominant in the scene? But it's almost like he's seeing the face of God. Yeah. So I pretty much on board with this this no, theory. That theory just is fuck. That's solid as. Fuck. Fuck. And I can't think of anything to really debunk it. And I mean the title of the fucking movie. That's a very good point. I didn't even consider that, but yeah. yeah. Which is and crazy because Cheng doesn't forgive anybody well, in the okay, movie. In, the, in, in one of the earlier drafts of the script, during the fight with Cheng and Julian. Oh, he does. Like, yeah, I know this. So yeah. about ha- like so about halfway through the fight, like Chang's just sitting there dodging for the most part. Then halfway through the fight, he's like, "Fuck this!" Starts whooping ass. But he mentions a line. In the original script, before he makes that change, he looks at Julian and says, "I forgive you," and then beats the living fuck out of him. Which I think that line would have made would have worked so well, dude. Yes. But there is also that moment when he's dodging, he's dodging, and he grabs Ryan Gosling's wrist. Before he can punch him and then punches him in the face in mm-hmm. response. Where he, he kind of has that I forgive you kind of look to mm-hmm. it. So I feel like a lot of people are missing out on this subtext. Which, again, it's... it's once You have, you have to look at the whole thing after multiple viewings to kind of really wrap your head around what this movie is about. And we could very well be wrong. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily... I know possible. the whole reason this movie exists is because Nicholas Wendell Reference said that he got the idea... We'll, we're going to jump in our tr- to yeah, our yeah. trivia section... Uh, that he got the idea after his wife gave birth to a second daughter and he had this very kind of existential crisis and he was filled with a lot of hatred and anger, which, you know, I can say this hasn't been, I can say this. I've had it. I have a kid. I've been through the, uh, the experience of giving, of, you know, creating life and it's going to sound so fucking like pretentious, but whatever. I can understand that you're. Most people would say, oh, you're supposed to feel happy. You're supposed to feel great that you brought this life into this world. And that's not always the case. I love my son, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, but you do get this sort of weird feeling afterwards of like, you know, this super existential kind of vibe for, and it, it lasts a long time. It's still, I'm still kind of feeling the effects of it because I remember seeing my son when he was first born, cried like a baby, <laughs> me and him at the same time, but I just, it's an indescribable amount of emotions and you go through the whole range, anger, joy depression all within days and he says that he got this idea after experiencing that and he had he wanted to release this anger and this this weird feeling in an outlet and so he came up with this idea for the script of this ultra violence i've seen interviews of him describing the pov shots of julian clenching his fist and saying you know when the fist is clo- I'm going to paraphrase a little bit but when he, okay. when, a, when a fist is closed you know it can do you know uh, it can do harm but when it's open you know, it's an invitation. It's it's kind of the way he was basically saying that a closed fist breeds violence. It's it's irrefutable, mm-hmm. and that's the, one of the first scenes we have with Julian is him clenching his fist, and it's right after I think Billy mentions "Time to Meet the Devil," if I'm not mistaken. So that's where he got the idea from, and uh, just he put basically all of life's all of his life's problems into this format and said he imagined having a physical fist fight with God because of how angry he was. And Damn. that's that puts builds more into our theory, yeah. And so, because it, it, it literally the film the film culminates in a fist fight with Chang. So yeah, pretty much. I mean, and I mean fuck. you already you already mentioned it that yeah his direction was that he kept whispering in Chang in the character that plays Chang's ear. You, you know, you are God. That's literally the direction he gave him, which I think is a super interesting interpretation of how he chose to play god yeah. very vengeful very old testament like but yeah. believable at the same time you i can say wholeheartedly that i was terrified of changing this whole movie oh yeah if you're if you watch this movie you're not like oh, like just terrified of Chang. like and i'm impressed i'm i was super impressed by this dude's performance oh he's great and i'm surprised i haven't seen him in more it kind of feels like that i've re- seen him in one other movie oh yeah it was the hangover two. Oh, is he, he played hangover the two? minister I don't, I don't remember. I was going to say, it feels like Reffin kind of tapped It's the into, only thing I've ever seen him. I was going to say, it, it kind of feels like it should have been like how Tarantino tapped into Christoph Waltz that Reffin kind of tapped into this guy, because this guy is amazing. Oh, dude, he's brilliant. Uh, I would and, love to see this guy. In, 
Yeah, the, in anything. I would like to see him in like a raid movie or something, which I know is Indonesian, oh, but holy shit. shit, dude, this guy can kick ass. That would be insane. Uh, the last little bit of trivia I want to talk about, which it, it's controversial, which I can understand. This yeah. this is what had me worried when this movie came. When I heard about this movie and I saw the trailer, I was super ecstatic to see it. Same because the trailer, as we as we listened to earlier, looks fantastic and it's action packed and it's visually cool. The, I mean, you got the neon lights, you got the downtown seediness of Thailand, you've got. Ryan Gosling, you've got this fight, this score, this beautiful cinematography. This movie, it 100% should succeed. And to me, it does. Yeah. But apparently, that wasn't the case at the Cannes Film Festival where it premiered, where this film was booed, actually. Which is not surprising if you know the Cannes Film Festival, because a lot of movies get booed there. But my question was always, at what point do you boo it? Because this movie has such a slow kind of build... And every scene, it just it builds tension. It builds more tension. And there's parts where you you you're watching you and on the on your first viewing especially, and you're just like, I don't know what I'm watching. Like when he cuts off the 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 uh, older Thai gentleman's arms, yeah, yeah. And he's you just kind of see Chang's face as it like pushes into him. It's very like kind of taken aback. Like what am I watching? But you get you drawn into it. And I feel like the the audience at this particular screening just wasn't film film. I it could have very bit well been one jackass booing it, and then everyone else joined in on it. But that was always my question: is is what at what point did they boo? I would love to know. I never got an answer. I would love to know what point where they did someone start booing it. True, because there's yeah. this film starts off strong and like it keeps going, and for me anyway, but. Yeah, that, really? that was always. I was into this movie from the, like the fucking first scene. Like I was just so interested. I was like, because he doesn't this? spoon. Because uh, Reffin doesn't spoon feed you no, shit. No, and this he movie makes you fucking work. This movie more than it. Drive did for sure. Oh yeah, because the opening scene of Drive kind of like closed case told you exactly what the yeah. movie's about. Uh, Even I mean Neon. From what I know about Neon Demon, it's a little more. It's uh, from what I've heard of Neon Demon. Because again, I still haven't. I've yet to see it. It's a good mix of this and Drive, apparently. I was going to say, it looks like, just from the trailer, this mixed with, like, Black Swan. Fuck. And I have, I have Neon well, Demon. I just I meant more in, it. like, the way that Drive is a little more straightforward. Yeah. Neon Demon apparently leans a little more towards On this, that. the kind of spirituality. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. On well, Drive. no, it's, like, it's, like, super, like, it's, like, visually, it looks more like this movie. And, like, it's very heavy and all that subtext and whatnot. But there's more dialogue, basically, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yes. More this wine. This, I think, is, what, the third episode in a row where we've been drinking while doing this? Well, we're having a nice Riesling. I mean, right. it's, it's. I feel like it's better to drink wine on a podcast than beer, because beer, you can get all burpy, you know, all full and everything. Uh, so that is Only God Forgives. You want to talk about the silver lining? Uh, again, to recap, this movie kind of ends with... Chang getting vengeance on everyone that tried to put a hit on, on him, including Crystal, and uh, eventually Julian by cutting off his arms, which Julian kind of turns himself in uh, to get his judgment by God for all intents and purposes. So, Mally, what is your silver lining to what happens to our characters here at the end? Justice was served. Uh, that was going to be mine, but I wanted to get this theory out, and I didn't want you, because we, we share notes, obviously. I didn't want you to see okay. what my theory was. I wanted to hear what you thought about it, but yeah, that's that was mine. Justice is served 100%. Chang, as God, gets his vengeance on everybody that did him, nope. that did wrong, pretty much. The devil has been slain. However, I have oh, a God. second one. Uh, Julian realized his mistake of trying to go against god pretty much he gets in the fight with him and he pretty much really he, he why he accepts his judgment and he accepts his punishment i feel like that is a total switch in character because julian this whole time seems to be running from something mm-hmm. including like my mate brings up a good point she mentions why do you let your mother talk like to you like that from the awkward dinner scene and he says because she's my mother and then that's why i feel like gosling was 100 percent right with the whole you know, would he smile at her death? Would he cry at her death? He said neither. He would cut her open. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. And I never would have thought of that, but yeah. I feel like Julian learned his lesson. Not only that, he, he, he got to meet God. He got to take out his anger or whatever it was that was wrong with him, pretty much. So that's my silver lining is 
Yours, yours is 100% the big one. Chang gets his vengeance on everybody that tried to take him out. He judges everybody accordingly. Mine is Julian learns his lesson, for sure. Okay. Okay. Do you think he goes back to America after this? Do you, does he go back to Mai? Which, according to the script, yeah, he goes back to Mai. But, man, that's the only that's the only thing I can't figure out was how does Mai fit into this whole thing? I, the guardian angel idea is... It, it's soft. I will yeah, say that. It is. But it, it's definitely possible. I just really wish I could figure that one out. I might have to do a part two. <laughs> that is Only God Forgives from 2013, <laughs> directed by Nicholas Winding Reference. If you enjoy our show, please join us on iTunes by subscribing. You can get all the new episodes this minute they come out. Uh, you can please leave us some feedback and a rating. That would be super awesome. You can go over to our Facebook page, Silver Linings Playlist, and give us a suggestion for a movie that you'd like like us to talk about. Or you can give us some feedback on some previous episodes that we have. Speaking of suggestions, mm-hmm. they might need to pick me up after this. Good point. I didn't. I, I missed that you, part. Uh, what would you recommend after watching Only God Forgives? What's going to bring him up a little bit? Well, obviously, the big star in this movie is Ryan Gosling. Of course. Uh, and you want to watch, obviously, something... I don't maybe funny, maybe a little upbeat. Maybe a movie where he doesn't get his ass kicked. A hundred percent. You want to see Ryan Gosling in a different light, which actually makes my pick very ironic. But go ahead. And I feel like this movie is the weirdest Ryan Gosling we've got to date. Uh, but it's also super funny and super good, like uplifting movie. I'm okay. gonna go with Lars and the Real Girl. Ooh, nice choice. A underrated Ryan Gosling flick. Fair, dude, and his mustache alone, right? Great. <laughs> um, speaking of Ryan Gosling and mustaches, I'm going a little more modern with mine. I'm going the nice guys. The nice guys, of from course. Last year, Shane Black, Russell Crowe. Love Crow. me some Shane Black. Love I still haven't me. seen it, but I've heard nothing oh, dude, but good it's things. On, uh, it, for anyone interested, it just got put up on HBO. Like HBO, if you have HBO Go or yeah. HBO Now, it just got put up like a week ago. I need to get HBO. And now. I've watched it. I think it got put up like I think like a week ago. I've watched it twice. It's. it's I've heard nothing but it's, good things. Oh, dude, it's so good. Ryan Gosling should do more comedies. It's dude, super his funny. comedic time. Like, it, comedic timing dude, in La La Land. Fucking actor. I feel like we've done a lot of Ryan Gosling now. Actually, we have Ryan Gosling and Ryan Reynolds. Which <laughs> I'm not complaining. No, so, no, no, no. What Ryan Gosling movie are we going to do next week? <laughs> well, it's not a Ryan Gosling movie. That's a bummer. But, you know, I have to say, we have a tendency to try. We try to do this. We can't always justify it or try and make it happen every time. But we try to do movies that are really good. We both can unanimously unanimously agree on they're great mm-hmm. movies. And we try to do kind of weird movies or funny movies or just plain out stupid movies. Okay. Uh, i.e. Planet of the Apes, yes. i.e. Nick, Cla- Nick Cage's Wicker Man. Hey, that was a good one. Next week's, we're definitely going to dive into the what and the weird kind of movies. Yeah. My clue for next week is that if you have a friend who likes to build model airplanes, don't be that f- person's friend anymore. <laughs> okay. So okay. do with that what you will. I think it's a pretty vague one, but yeah. that, that is a clue for next week. So, Mally, is there anything else you want to talk about? Actually... Before you do, I have something I would like to talk about. All right. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned on this on the air to the fullest context, but uh, we only have a few episodes left in what we can, I guess, call season one yeah. of Silver Linings Playlist. Uh, we're going to go on a bit on a hi- hiatus pretty soon. I think we have two more episodes before the hiatus. I think so, yeah. Sure. Uh, so after that, I'm making the move out to the West Coast to L.A., uh, and we're going to take a little bit of a break until we can figure out exactly how we can do the show justice from literally the opposite sides yeah. of the country. We'll figure. We got some ideas. We definitely have ideas. It's going to be... The, 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 that first episode back might be a little interesting. And I think season two, we're going to try and do some things a little bit differently, yeah. some some ideas in the works. But uh, we got two more, I think, left. Uh, so definitely we have next week's episode. It's going to be a weird one. And then possibly a special episode... Yeah, uh, you pitched me the special idea for our uh, season one I, finale earlier. I super, super hope we'll, it goes we'll down. S- we'll see about that one. If not, we'll that see. might be a season two premiere. Okay. But, we'll see uh, what we can do with We've it. got two left before we go on a little bit of a hiatus, but it won't be for long. Uh, so I just want to give people the word, the heads up on that to, to look out for those. So uh, anything else you want to talk about before we sign off for this week? Uh, as always. Yeah, let's do as always. Ready? Oh, God. Thank <laughs> you.
Excelsior. Excelsior.